All right, so it's time for one more type of trigonometric substitution. And this, I just have to admit, I overlooked this one. I accidentally left it out when I posted my series of videos originally on trigonometric substitution, okay? So there were two substitutions that I addressed in earlier videos, and then this is the new one for the case that the integral contains a difference of squares like so, root x squared minus a squared, okay? And if we see that, and the integral might have other things in it, but if we see that, we'll substitute x as a secant theta, okay? Uh, there is some fine print. I'll talk a little bit about the fine print when I'm done doing my first problem. But the x being more than a or x being less than negative a, that will keep this number in here positive under that root, which we would need it to be positive uh, for the sake of the square root, right? The angles, I'll say, I haven't really addressed these restrictions on the angles. In my other videos, the fine print was there, but I didn't really talk about it. And so I do think it's time that I talk a little bit about why the angles are restricted like this, okay? All right, so I'll do that. I'll come back to that though in a minute. Uh, let's do this problem, evaluate this definite integral with these bounds, okay? So this does have that expression root x squared minus a squared. The a appears to be 2, right? x squared minus 4 is x squared minus 2 squared. So I think we have our substitution. It's going to be 2 secant theta, all right? So let's do this. I'm going to I'll work this integral just as an indefinite integral first. I'll find the antiderivative, okay? And because that's how these are evaluated, that's what the fundamental theorem of calculus says. I can find the um, antiderivative of this and put in the bounds two for my lower bound and four for my upper bound, for x, if I get my antiderivative back in terms of x, okay? So, all right, I will make the substitution. What was it? X is 2 secant theta. And I will get this integral in terms of a new variable, theta. As it is, it's in terms of x and the differential dx. I need to get it in terms of theta and the differential d theta. That would be what it would be, uh, what it requires to change the variable to theta. So I need, here's what I'm saying. I need the dx substituted also. Substitute the x like so. Substitute the dx as 2. What's the derivative of a secant? Uh, secant theta tangent theta d theta. So that will take care of all the substitutions that I need. Okay. So let's do this. In my first step, um, I want to see this as root x squared. I'm going to substitute 2 secant theta. So that's going to be 4 secant squared theta. All right. Minus 4. So that's what's under the root. Down here, x squared. Okay, that will be 4 secant squared theta again. And dx will be 2 secant theta tangent theta d theta. Okay. All right, so my substitution is made at this point. I'll continue to simplify it from here. Now, the reason this identity works is because of the way it simplifies that root right there, okay? Uh, let me talk a little bit about that. So first of all, um, let's do this. See, just that part, I'm not concerned about the rest of this, but that 4 secant squared minus 4. Just the part under the root. I can factor out 4 and get secant squared theta minus 1. Okay? So truth is, like, I remember some identities. Others I don't. It, I don't really care because I can figure them out one way or another. I could look them up if I had to. But they all come from this, or many of them that we use in these problems come from this Pythagorean identity. Okay? So suppose I can remember this one. Suppose you're me and and you just don't have a good memory. So I know this one, and I know that if I were to take this and divide all terms of this equation by cosine squared, which I can do that if I want to, 
then I'll get another identity that will be what? Sine squared over cosine squared is tangent squared plus cosine squared over itself is 1 and 1 over cosine squared is secant squared. Okay, so then I see there's an identity right there that I can use. Secant squared minus 1 is tangent squared. So what you see under the root is 4 tangent squared theta. That's what you have. Okay, so I have root 4 and root tangent squared, which will be tangent. All right, so I've simplified just that part under the root, and I showed you how, like, I personally remember that identity, okay? I start with this one. I divide the whole thing by cosine squared. I get a new identity that I can use. All right, so let's do, let's update like this. All right, so what do we figure out about that root? That's going to be 2 times tangent, all right? So that's what I've got sitting right over here. Here I get 4 secant squared. And then still this differential part over here, well, the, the part with the d theta, 2 secant theta times tangent theta. d theta. Okay, I haven't done anything with that either. All right, so let's think about what we can do from this point. So some things obviously cancel. I got a 2 and a 2. That's a 4 on top and a 4 on the bottom. Okay? So the numbers are gone. I can cancel 1 secant here with 1 there. So I'm going to have tangent squared on top over secant. All right, let's try that. Tangent squared theta over secant. If you consolidate all that stuff. That's what you're going to get. All right. Uh, now I've got to think of some way to deal with this. So how, here's, I could be wrong, obviously, but here's what I'm inclined to do with this. So tangent squared is sine squared over cosine squared. Okay. So that's what I've got on top right there. And then secant on the bottom, that's 1 over cosine. Okay, so here's what we have, but I'm going to consider it this way. I'm going to see where that gets me. This could be the wrong direction. You know, I mean, there's lots of trig identities you can use. Uh, yeah, but I'm going to, I'll go ahead and pursue this. So let's see. Uh, I will get sine squared over cosine squared times cosine over 1. So that will reduce to sine squared theta over cosine. That's something I think I can work with. Okay, let me show you why. All right. So with what I just did on scratch paper, this here is sine squared over cosine. All right. So let's go ahead and write that. Okay. And the reason why I think I can do something with this is because sine squared has this identity that relates to cosine. 1 minus cosine squared. That's just a variation of the Pythagorean identity right here. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Therefore... 1 minus cosine squared is sine squared, okay? So say I have that, and I know it doesn't feel like it, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting closer. Here's where I think we really get the answer. This, if I separate it, is 1 over cosine minus cosine squared over cosine. So it's 1 over cosine minus Cosine squared over cosine. What's 1 over cosine? That would be secant. I know the antiderivative of secant. I've used that in other videos. I, I think I even derived that formula from scratch. But I know that one. Minus cosine squared over cosine. That's just cosine. So I know that one. So I, I finally got to a point where I could work it. You know, if you're smarter than me, you maybe figured it out up there. But I, I get here, and I know the answer. What is the antiderivative of secant? 
is natural log absolute value secant theta plus tangent theta. Okay, minus, what is the antiderivative of cosine? That one's easier. That one's just sine theta plus c. Okay, so I get this, and now I have this option that if I could put this back in terms of x, I could evaluate this way. You see the bounds here are not just 2 to 4, but x is equal to 2 over to x is equal to 4, right? We have different variables now. When you say 2 and 4, you can say, do you mean theta is 2, theta is 4, or x? Well, we started with x. So if I can get this antiderivative in terms of this original variable x, then I substitute my bounds as you see it, okay? So let's see if we can do that. Here's, here's how I've done it for you in other videos. Uh, I'll just see what are the implications about this angle if I'm saying that secant theta is x over 2, right? Doesn't this mean secant theta is x over 2? Isn't that correct? Yeah, okay, so what would theta be like if secant theta was x over 2? Uh, okay, well, so we have to think secant is this side over this side, hypotenuse over adjacent. So that's x and that's 2. What's this side over here? By the Pythagorean theorem, if a squared plus b squared is c squared, we all learned the Pythagorean theorem at one point, then this will be x squared minus 4. Okay, so here goes. Natural log of, well, secant theta is x over 2. I guess we had that one from the beginning. All right. Tangent theta is root x squared minus 4 over 2. Okay, minus sine theta. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So that's going to be root x squared minus 4 over x. Okay, so there's our antiderivative, I guess, plus c. Okay, all right. Now I was saying from there, we got to take this and put it in here, okay, with the bounds four and two. I think I have room to do that. I'm gonna take a gamble, I'm gonna tr try to do it right up there. So I'm gonna say this thing right here, this is the antiderivative in terms of the variable x that I was talking about up there. What's this give you if you put four in? natural log of 2 plus natural log of, so 4 squared 16, that's 12, root 12 over 2, okay? So here's what I'm going to get. Natural log, absolute value, 2 plus root 12 over 2, okay? And then here, when I put 4 in, I'll get root 12 over 4, okay? All right, so that's what I get with my antiderivative, ignoring the c, when I put this upper bound of 4 in. What about the lower bound of 2? I'll get natural log of 1 plus, what's 2 squared? 2 squared is 4, 4 minus 4 is 0. So that's 0. That's also 0. So I'll just get minus natural log of 1. Okay, now... This will give it to me. I'll simplify a little bit. Root 12 is, well, 12 is 4 times 3, so that's going to be 2 root 3. So I'll get natural log 2 plus 2 root 3 over 2. So that'll be root 3. Okay? This part here, root 12 over 4, again, 12 is 4 times 3. So that is 2 root 3. So I'm going to get minus root 3 over 2. And then natural log of 1 is 0. So I've got my answer. All right. There it is. There it is. Okay. Now, uh, is this the only way to do it? No, it's not the only way to do it. Um, I It would be wrong if I didn't address that we don't have to 
to do this last part where we change this antiderivative in terms of x and put it back in with our original bounds of x is 2 to x is 4. Okay? We could have left it in terms of theta and changed the bounds. All right? So here's what I'm saying. If I'm going to do, oh, let's do like this, or if the bounds are changed. along with a new variable, all right? Then this is the way it would work. Say we got this integral two to four. Uh, okay, root, what was it? X squared minus four over X squared DX. You could get this antiderivative and leave it in terms of theta, but then you're gonna have like theta equals and theta equals, okay? All right, so, but how does that translate? If x is 2, what does that make theta? That's how you change the bounds. What's, what, what's the link between x and theta? It's right here, isn't it? So x is 2 secant theta. So if x is 2, what's theta? All right, so 2, 2 secant theta. That says secant theta is 1. What's secant? Secant's 1 over cosine. That says 1 over cosine is 1. So that says cosine is 1. All right. So cosine's 1. All right, what's that mean for theta? That means theta is pi over 2. All right. Or sorry, 0. 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. All right. So this will be 0. Theta is 0. That's our bound. If x is 2, then theta is 0. All right? Okay? Uh, what if x was the upper bound? x is 4. All right, so if x is 4, that means x being 2 secant theta. All right. Means we have 4 equals 2 secant theta. So that says secant theta is... 2, and since secant's 1 over cosine, that means cosine theta is a half. Okay, so what's the angle that gives you cosine is a half? It's 60 degrees, okay? I have a terrible memory. Let's see, cosine... Yep, yeah, okay, see, so that's going to be pi over 3, okay? Pi over 3. So this upper bound is pi over 3. All right, so you could have, if you so desired done this. What was that antiderivative when we left it in terms of theta? It was this. This is what it was when we put it back in terms of x. All right. So say you wanted to leave it, then it'd be like natural log of secant theta plus tangent theta minus sine theta. That's my antiderivative in terms of theta. These would be the bounds. Theta equals zero corresponds to the bound of x being two, and theta being pi over three corresponds to the bound of x being four. All right, so you could evaluate this. You put in pi over three, you find the secant and the tangent and the sine, and you put in zero, and you do the same thing. You'll still end up with this. It's not like you get a different answer. You may, in fact, think I'm wasting your time to tell you that you could do it this way, but it's something that you should know about. It wouldn't be right if I didn't include that at all, okay? So in these definite integrals, when you make a substitution, you can change back to the original variable, all right, and leave your bounds in terms of x, or take your antiderivative in terms of the substituted variable, theta in this case, and change the bounds to theta through the substitution. Remember, what we did was, if x is 2, that means theta is 0. I showed you the work, right? And if x is 4, that means theta is pi over 3. Well, you get the same answer, right? I'll, I'll leave it up to, me, to you. It's just something you need to know about, okay? All right, so I've done that one. Now, I, I said also I would talk a little bit about the fine print. Why do we restrict the angles the way we do? I'll say a little bit about that. Um, did, did you know, like, when we do this step right here, like here I got 
root tangent squared. And I said it was tangent. All right, there is a little uh, caveat to that. All right, so uh, just note something real quick. Is it actually true that the root of a number squared is that number? Is that a true statement for any number? Because I think we could take that for granted as being true. Uh, I mean, it looks true and so on, but not everything that looks true is. What if n was like, I don't know, negative 6? Is that really a true statement? Let's try it out. Is root negative 6 squared equal to negative 6? Okay. Uh, is root, what's negative 6 squared? 36 equal to negative 6. Six. No, that's not true. Okay, uh, the square root is defined to be a positive number. If you don't believe me, then we'll say, okay, so suppose I take root thirty-six. Now I see if it tells me negative six or not. It tells me six. I mean, uh, it's the principal root of thirty-six is six. It's a positive number. That's just how it's defined. So this is not true. All right. If you don't know whether that number n could be positive or negative then the most you could say is the square root of n squared is absolute value of n, okay? Now, the square root of n squared is n if n is greater than or equal to zero, though. For a positive number, you're not going to encounter this problem, all right? So, okay, now back to what I was saying. Uh, how does this relate to what we were doing? I mean, this is fine print, and I understand that you you might not care at all about fine print, but... When I did this problem, or when I do any of these trick substitution problems, I get things like root sine squared, and we say it's sine, or root cosine squared, we say it's cosine. Or in this case, when I simplified that, I got root tangent squared. Actually, I had root 4 tangent squared. I said it was 2 tangent. Uh, is that really true? So is root tangent squared theta equal to tangent? Why isn't it absolute value of tangent? Well, Look at these restrictions. If theta is from 0 to pi over 2, that puts you in quadrant 1. If theta is from pi to 3 pi over 2, that puts you in quadrant 3. Okay, so quadrant 1. And if we had this restriction, quadrant 3. All right, so take either one of those. So let's say this. So if theta is, say, between pi over 2 and zero. Say that that's the restriction we happen to have. It wouldn't really matter for the sake of this discussion which one it is. But take that one. Uh, okay, then tangent of theta will be a positive number. So that number that's being squared is a positive number. All right. So because of that, you're justified in saying that the root of tangent squared theta is tangent theta. If you did not have a restriction guaranteeing that the tangent of the angle was a positive number, you would have to reduce this in a way that it's absolute value. Okay, So this is the way that we usually have it. The restrictions allow us to do that. If you just had root tangent squared and said theta can be any angle, then you would have to reduce it like this. You would have to say, well, it's absolute value of tangent. Really, it is. This right here proves that if that number turns out to be negative, we need to reduce by absolute value to get a true statement. All right? And if we had to do our integrals and reduce them and get absolute values, that would really get us stuck. All right? It would be hard to give us an extra thing to work with that would be harder to figure out. Okay? So that's why we have the restrictions on the angle. If you didn't, your simplifications of roots of squares would be more complicated. They would involve absolute value. Okay, so that's what I'll say about the fine print. There's more I could say about it, but uh, we should, you know, in calculus too, we should be familiar with this identity. Know what it is if the number is positive. See that the restriction guarantees that that happens. And if we didn't have the restriction, we should understand how it would work then too.